Good morning. Just before I get started this morning, there was something I saw, so I want to say something about it. But while you were extending your hands towards other people just a moment ago, I saw a person who actually lost their father, um, not super recently, but fairly recently. And as I watched them extend their hand, they extended their hand the way their father extended their hand when they prayed. He learned a position of authority in prayer that was passed on to him from a parent. And uh, I hope you know how powerful it is when you are in rooms like this and you have those opportunities and you extend your hand towards someone else or raise it just because you need, you're passing something on to another generation so that when they need God, they'll know what to do. Or when they want to add authority to a prayer, they'll know how to take a position of authority. Amen? Amen. Well, welcome to Vision Sunday. If you don't know what that is, it means that we use this day to kind of express some things we're grateful for that God has done over the last 12 months and then some things to be hopeful for in the coming months. And if you're interested, underneath your seat or in the pocket of the seat in front of you, there is a little booklet and the booklet kind of carries a lot of information. I'm going to highlight some of that today, but I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> that would not be a good use of our time. We are going to share a lot of information today. And uh, in case you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm starting my clock. That's, that's how I'll know when I'm over. It actually doesn't stop me from going over, but it lets me know when that occurred. Um, we're gonna share a lot of things that happened in 2021. And, and let me just start by saying this, this is not us bragging about us. I don't feel that way at all. I do think that we have a lot of things to brag about with God. He's been very generous. He's been very kind. He's been very present. And I also know that 2021 wasn't a great year for lots of people, that there are people who have experienced losses and disappointments and, and all kinds of challenges. And the two things that I would say is, in spite of that, you also now have a testimony of the faithfulness of God. And as a church family, we were honored to be able to walk through that year with you to be able to stand with you and support you. We're glad that we could do that. Our goal is for people to see not us. Our goal is for people to see Jesus. And our hope is that when people come into places like this, they will experience a rebirth of their own hope. They'll discover the kind of resiliency that can happen when you experience the grace of God. Now, there's some things that I want to just highlight quickly as we go through this morning. Uh, this last year marked the completion of our capital campaign. That, that occurred in November. 95% of everything that was pledged came in, and that was in the middle of COVID and not being able to meet in person, all of those things. We, uh, we received pledges of $1.2 million, and $1.1 million of those dollars came in. Amen. Yeah. And I feel like I always need to say this. The goal was not a nicer space for us. The goal was more space for others who haven't yet experienced the grace of God for themselves. In fact, that extra space actually helped us when we did gather back in person under some of the guidelines that were, we were required to follow with social distancing and all of those things. We were actually able to get more people into the space. And so I'm very grateful for that. Every week, in fact, we see more and more people returning and coming back. And uh, uh, still on Sundays, I have someone that, that will tell me, this is my first week back and I'm always thrilled uh, to see them. We're always grateful for those of you who watch online, and I'm glad that we're able to offer this option. But what I can tell you, while this is good, being here is actually even better. Any, any agreement with that? What do you think? Yeah? Some of you sound unsure. <laughs> uh, uh, every week, not only are people coming back, but also our volunteers, people who will serve. They'll use their spiritual gifts and serve others. Believe it or not, Roughly 79% of the people who show up here on campus on a Sunday have found a way to regularly serve others. 
I think that's amazing. Yeah. That has enabled all kinds of ministries to be able to not only go forward, but to expand. Last January, not the most recent one, but in 2021, we started by only being able to have kids men for one Sunday a month because that was all the volunteers that we had. And through as the year went on, more and more volunteers came back until uh, by the time we hit mid-year, we were able to have uh, kids ministry every single Sunday. And what I can tell you about that is, is that when those kids came in, they were incredibly grateful just for the opportunity to be together. By the way, our serving is not limited just to what goes on in, in this room on Sundays. We have teams that went out and helped with construction and maintenance on a number of homes. In fact, on one Saturday, I walked into this building and there were 80 people in the lobby eating breakfast, getting ready to go out and serve other homes and businesses in our community. I think that's phenomenal. We had teams that went down to Clara Barton School, which is a, a school we've kind of adopted down in the city. Five times they went down uh, to support students and families and their teachers uh, in the inner city. We have over 30 volunteers now who have connected with World Relief to help provide being a good neighbor as Afghan refugees come into our city. It's amazing what God can do when we make ourselves available, available to him. And then our deaf ministry has continued to grow. In fact, we were able to appoint leadership to our deaf ministry, Brian and Jennifer Cornwell. They've been doing a phenomenal job. We were actually were able to have two small groups, two rooted groups in deaf ministry alone. And we actually, our church was able to host a deaf women's ministry conference, which I think is phenomenal. And we actually have classes for kids who are deaf or what they call CODAs, children of deaf adults. So the deaf community is growing in our church family. You're in the nine o'clock service, so you might not see them as often in the 11 o'clock service. They take up a whole section over here. How many can thank God for the work that he's doing in the deaf community here? Yeah. And then quarantine, if it taught us one thing, is that being alone is not good for us. When we relaunched groups, we were able to use our expanded facilities to provide the space that was needed and still follow guidelines. And, and over 250 of you signed up to, be, to, to do life with someone else for a few weeks and to see how deep you could go in your faith with God. And then kids ministry and student ministry. Uh, uh, the kids have really struggled over the last couple of years. And uh, when we reopened ministries on Sundays, they weren't just excited about it, they were incredibly grateful for it. Uh, last fall, we were able to relaunch our ministries for kids on Wednesdays. And uh, they've been absolutely loving that option. It, it's not just babysitting for our kids, it's, it's an investment into their lives. Students also came back too. And in case you don't know this, 70% of all the students who attend here actually serve other students. There's over 50 of them on an average Wednesday, and 70% of them serve. In fact, 38 new teens begin to attend our student ministry. Next Sunday, we're going to be baptizing actually a foreign exchange student who came from the other side of the planet to be here, got invited by a friend to go to youth group, and then went to fall retreat, and now they're following Jesus into the waters of baptism next Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> And Outpost, which is our college ministry and young adults, they're also back. Over 70 of them have been involved in groups and 20 of those actually serve other young adults. Over 90 young adults have participated in an Outpost event. Surveys tell us that college age and young adults are disinterested in God, they're disinterested in the Bible, and they're disinterested in church. And what we can say is that has not been our experience. Their passion for God, for his word, and for his people is something that's inspiring. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Well, let's just go ahead. If we're going to I think we should start a new rule. If one person claps, everybody claps. What, what do you think? Young at heart. <laughs> I don't know if that was testing the waters or if it was for young at heart or, yeah. I'll, I may revisit that rule before we're done. We'll, we'll see. Young at heart. 
unable to meet for over a year. This is our 55 and over group. And that group suffered some significant losses, including the loss of the person who was leading the group, Ken Reed. And you would think of all the demographics in our church, they would be the most hesitant to return. But that's not true. I was there the first day they were back. And I wish you could have heard their voices lifted in praise and singing. It was inspiring. Jonathan and Sharon Martino have been appointed to lead that ministry now. They have so much energy and so much passion for this. And I'm just grateful for what God is doing because the glory of God and the spirit of God and the grace of God are not limited by age demographics. Amen? From the youngest to the, mo to the oldest among us, God is still real and he's still powerful. Uh, we also said uh, goodbye to uh, Ben, our worship director. He's passionately obeying God's direction in his life and now lives in Michigan. And the person who is our worship director now is John Iacucci. Can we thank him for... Uh, yeah. If, if he looked remarkably energized and relaxed today, it's because he just returned from Florida. So he looks a little less translucent than the rest of us right now. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in such things, uh, this Thursday will be Currents. This room will be filled full of people who have a passion for God and want to raise their voice and acknowledge his goodness together. And I think that'll be a really good use of your time if you'd like to do that. In all of this, in all of this, you've been faithful in your prayers and you've been faithful in your support. And one of the things we do on Vision Sunday is we actually give you information about the finances. We, we think you have a right to know what came in, what was done with it, what's left, what our plans are. And so if you just turn your attention to the screen, uh, we want to show you that. Church family. One of the things that is incredibly important to us is to be transparent with our resources. You are so generous all year long with your giving, and we want to honor that by showing you what the money you gave has gone towards. So let's take a look at the income we took in, and then we'll look at where it was spent. You can see here our categories for how we received income. We have benevolence, our building, income from rentals, registration fees, and interest. You gave to missions, which have supported over 20 different countries hearing the gospel. Compared to 2020, our tithes and offerings actually increased by 8.95%, which is amazing considering all the hardships we've had to face this year. We thank God for His faithfulness and for your faithfulness as well. Now, to the expenses. And to do great ministry, it costs money. And it's your generosity that continues to allow us to reach and serve our community. We invested $28,714 into benevolence, $153,416 in a building to gather and worship Jesus for people of all different ages. We spent $56,963 in office supplies to help spread the word of God. $576,225 went to our 20 plus staff who help lead and disciple our church. And we invested $189,729 in ministry, both serving people in person and our community joining us online. We also think it is really important to be a generous church. For missions, our church was honored to give $45,431 away, which is more than $17,000 above and beyond, which was contributed in designated missions funds. This includes $6,690 to Aki's Place to help rescue young girls from a life of slavery and over $8,000 to helping serve orphans in Haiti. On top of this, we invested in our Hope Fund, or our Benevolence, seeking to help people in need in sustainable ways. 
Our church sent $4,275 to help those whose homes were destroyed by a tornado down south. And we gave $10,000 to refugees fleeing a war-torn Afghanistan. This year, we also wrapped up our next building campaign. And we are so thankful to have a new space where people have already come to find faith in Christ for the first time. Praise God. In addition to our church's annual giving, you gave $254,062 to expand our facility. What's amazing about this whole project is that 95% of all that was pledged to the campaign was actually contributed. Oftentimes when churches are already enjoying a space like we were able to do this past year, giving toward a building goes way down. But this was not the case for us, as you all continued to give generously. Our church spent $5,279 to finish up our building expansion project in 2021. We were also able to eliminate some additional debt on our mortgage, paying down an additional $360,000 towards our principal. And here's the thing, I know these numbers can all be a lot. Our goal is to be transparent with you and to be sure you know that all these numbers represent real money that was able to serve real people in need. The gospel has been preached, our community has been served, and our world has been impacted by your generosity. You have shown that you're not just a consumer, but you are a partner and you care about making a difference in people's lives. Thank you for your faithfulness. The best is truly yet to come. Yeah. So a couple of things, you, you probably saw quite a large number related to staff, and, and some people wonder if I get all of that. <laughs> the answer is no, I don't. We have, uh, we have roughly 20 staff. And we don't disclose uh, individual staff salaries, but I understand that sometimes people wonder if the person responsible for primary leadership at an organization uh, gets too much or not enough. And so uh, what I do every year for Vision Sunday is I bring a copy of my W-2. I did black out my social security number and things like that. I don't want my identity stolen, uh, but uh, if you are interested in that, I've got a little table right up here in the front where I sit, and uh, that'll be on there at the end of service, and you can actually see what it is that I make. We don't disclose other salaries, but if you want to know what I make, uh, uh, we're happy to do that. And then secondly, in a council meeting yesterday, uh, out of the goodness of God and his graciousness to us, we made a determination that uh, for every dollar we give to a missionary over the course of this last year, for next year, we're gonna give two. That means we're doubling our missions commitment for next year, yeah. And the reason we do that is because we believe that God blesses us to be a blessing, not just to consume. And so we've committed ourselves to that. In Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy. Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand in which he had taken the tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Our new space is not a finish line. It's a starting line. We want everyone to experience the grace of God for themselves and to be part of a community of faith. This is not a declaration that we are the only church in our region. I know most of the pastors who serve in our region, and they are godly men and women. And I'm grateful to be considered one of many who serve here. 
My hope and prayer is that every single house of faith will be filled to overflowing with people who are connecting with God and with each other. Amen? Amen. But not because someone is drawn to a personality or a particular kind of architecture. We want God to be the most important thing. Some want others to become Christians so that they'll behave better. You know, maybe if my spouse became a believer, they would be a little easier to get along with. Don't get me wrong, you know, improved behavior has its benefits, but God came to this world to do way more than just modify our behavior. In fact, for some of you, that's really been your only experience with God is that your behavior is slightly changed. My prayer for you is that you would experience something of the holiness and the glory of God because it will change how you see yourself and how you see the world. And this is what scripture tells us, the whole world, the whole world is filled with, how would you fill in that blank? Because I hear a lot of people filling in that blank. But I have to go to scripture to find this example. The whole world is filled with the glory of God. Not will be, not used to be. It actually is right now. Isaiah heard something he didn't realize up to that point in his life. The whole earth is filled with God's glory. The whole world is filled with his glory. And experience with God will actually wind up changing your agenda in life. You can move from what, from what can God do for me to what can I do for God. And the difference is, is beginning to see his glory in our world. We want our gatherings not just to connect people with each other. We want our gatherings to connect people with the glory of God. We want, we want people to come not just to see what they can get, but to find out what God wants to do in our midst. Does that sound like a good thing? I think it's marvelous when we discover what it is that God wants to do. We want our gatherings to be a place where God gets his way. When, when people walk away from faith, it's often because they were disappointed, there was something they asked God for, and it didn't happen. And so rather than saying, well, I think that God exists, I just don't agree with him, so we're parting company, what they do is they try to end God. They say, I don't think he exists anymore. I don't believe that he is real, but God is actually the most real being in the universe. He always has been, he is right now, and he always will be. And what will he always be? He will always be holy, and he will always be glorious. He is always high and lifted up. And when we begin to see the beauty of his holiness, that's when our lives begin to be transformed. The question is, do you see the glory of God everywhere that you go? Now, Isaiah, once he saw the glory of God, also saw something about himself that wasn't very flattering, and, and he uses the word woe. Woe is me, I'm undone. The word woe can mean sadness or sorrow or unhappiness. It can also be a kind of judgment to denounce something. In Matthew 23, Jesus used this word repeatedly when he was talking about a group of people who, who saw that, that God as a way to control others. And, and so they were constantly trying to manipulate people by using religious language and religious rules. And Jesus would just tell him, he says, woe, because you are limiting and inhibiting others' access to God. Woe to you because you are trying to make people more like you than you are trying to make them like God. Woe to you because you are finding loopholes that you think excuse you from keeping the promises that you've made. Woe to you because you think giving something in a church actually exempts you from things like justice and mercy and faithfulness. Woe to you for focusing more on what you look like on the outside than what's actually going on on the inside. Woe for not being able to tell when other people are actually speaking the words of God. And this is what uh, Isaiah runs into. In the presence of God, he says, woe is me. He's not just saying he's sad. He's saying he's wrong. Before an encounter with God, we can only see what is wrong in others. But once we have an encounter with God, we begin to see what's going on in the inside of us. Now, Isaiah is an interesting person. He actually was of the royal family. He was young. He was educated. He was brilliant. He was eloquent. He was good with his words. But he only saw God as useful. 
And if all you can see is God is useful for you, you begin to see everyone else as a problem for you. And in this experience, he's realizing he's been completely wrong. Isaiah says, woe is me. I'm deeply saddened about how I've used my words, and I was wrong. Now, some people might claim this is the reason they can't serve. This is their exemption. I'm not good enough. I can't go out and make a difference. I've got too many skeletons in my closet. I've got too many weaknesses. And, and Isaiah had his, but he didn't use what he saw about himself as an excuse to no longer or to not ever engage in serving God. If you are disengaging from serving because of your view of yourself, you are looking too much at yourself. Look at God. Look at God. Seeing God for who he is and seeing himself for who he was, was the starting point for Isaiah, not the ending point. And when Isaiah saw his own sin, heaven was instantly activated. Seraphim went and, and took tongs and grabbed a coals off of the altar and flew towards him, not to penalize him or punish him for being a person of unclean lips, not to push him out of the presence of God, but to actually touch him at the point that he acknowledged he was, he was weak and he was wrong. And at that point, he received cleansing. He received freedom from guilt. So that's when God says, who will go for me? Who will go for us? And Isaiah responds, I am here, send me. When God is only useful to us, we're too busy for him. When God is only useful to us, we're always too busy for him. But when God becomes beautiful to us, we become available to him. I mean, if you're sitting at a cafe, you're having a cup of whatever your favorite tea or coffee is, and one of the most beautiful women you've ever seen or one of the most handsome men you've ever seen comes up and they say, excuse me, would it be okay if I sit at this table? What would you say? And would your answer be different if it was a person far less attractive? The reason we say no to God is we have not been, we've not yet seen his beauty. We're focused on something else. So we've not built this space so that people can be impressed with us. We built a space where people can be impressed with God. And if while you are here, you begin to realize that there's something in your life that makes you sad and there's something in your life that is wrong, what I want to say is good, good. Acknowledging that puts heaven in motion. The seraphim begin to fly towards you. Heaven begins to be activated to cleanse and to purify and to heal. It's a good thing to acknowledge those things in the presence of God. So our theme this year is actually the word sent. We're not just going to wander in and out of our world or in and out of life unintentionally. We want to move forward and through our world being able to see the glory of God. And when you see God's glory in a broken world, you will serve God. That's the distinction. The reason that, that Isaiah is able to say, send me, is because now he realizes the entire world is filled with his glory. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. When you see God's glory in the broken, you'll be willing to serve the broken. And when you see God's glory in the humble, you'll be willing to serve the humble. When you see God's glory in a classroom with stressed teachers and struggling students, you'll be willing to serve God in that classroom. If you can see God's glory in a hospital room with, with pain and brokenness, you'll be wanting to serve right in that very space, in offices where there's office politics and people trying to get promotions and trying to get positions. God's glory is there too. And in the neighborhood where families are frustrated and uncertain, God's glory is there. And in a family that's been shattered by divorce, God's glory is there. And the individual who's struggling with addiction, God's glory is there. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And that activates us to move. We're not seeking glory for ourselves. We're seeing God's glory. And that motivates and moves us. 
Until we see His glory, there's just places we won't go. The people we will not engage with. There are situations that we will avoid. So this year, our goal is not just to get a lot of people, more people than ever into this space. Our goal is to get anyone who comes into this space equipped, prepared to go into all the world where God's glory resides. I hope is that you will come to the place where you will say, here am I. You see, wherever you are, act like the one that was sent. Not because it's easy, not because it's fun, not because it requires nothing of you. If it feels like the walls are collapsing, the floor is falling out from underneath you. If all you see is the brokenness and the heartache in others, if you see anything of the glory of God, you will stand there and you will say, I am here. I've been sent. I've got words of hope and life. I can roll up my sleeves. I can make a difference. Because you've seen the glory of God there. Let's bow our heads. Father, help us to see you and to see your glory wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.